We're TTB, the Alcohol and Tobacco Tax and Trade Bureau. Hello, all. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we are so excited to be here with you. My name is Janelle Christian. I'm the Director of the Office and Industry and State Outreach at the Alcohol and Tobacco Tax and Trade Bureau, TTB. Um, so this is our inaugural TTB uh, webinar bootcamp. Um, it's the bootcamp for distillers. It's been a long time coming, so we're really happy that you're joining us here for it today. Um, because it is our very first one, you might have to bear with us if there's any tech issues or glitches, but we are going to try to make it seem like we've been doing this for a decade. Although technology back then, you know. Um, <laughs> but we started out with our boot camps. We first um, started doing them. They're usually a series of like four trying to cover soup to nuts of what you might need to know if you're a relatively new industry member interacting with TTB. So we started um, our first one for brewers several years ago, and then we added one for cideries. Uh, just last year, we did our very first one um, for distillers. We pre um, presented that in a four part session last year. And um, so now we're excited to transition that into the 21st century via Zoom and offer it to you in your living room, office, wherever you might be, uh, potentially in your cozies, um, as you should be. And um, we're really excited about it because not only are we doing it live with you here today, but we, um, knock on wood, if technology is in our favor, we will be recording it, transcribing it, and posting it to our website so you can watch it again and again whenever you would like to, and you can share it with your friends. So, um, so with that, um, we have a few housekeeping items. So as I mentioned, this webinar is being recorded. Um, as attendees, you don't have your audience or your mics turned on, um, but we will be reading your questions or we will attempt to read your questions um, at the end of the webinar. So if you do have those, um, if you have questions, make sure to submit those um, via the um, questions box. Um, the slides from today's presentation will be posted on our website. So um, if you go to ttb.gov um, on that main page, on the right hand side, there's an icon that says get training. If you click on that, um, there'll be another icon that says presentations. And that's a really easy way to access our presentations page. Um, it's separated by commodity. And um, so you'll just have to look for the distilled spirits um, section of it. And you'll find this um, beginning tomorrow is when we'll have it posted, um, along with a, a lot of other informational presentations in PowerPoint format. Um, and again, I had mentioned that this is going to be recorded, transcribed, and posted. Um, that will be posted on that Get Training page. So that's where you will find that. Um, give us a, a few days, maybe a week, to get that posted. Um, so that covers this presentation, but are you asking yourself, will there be more? It is a series after all. Um, at least we're hoping that's what you're asking us. And the answer to that is yes, there will be more. So our plan is to offer this in a six part series. So six modules. Uh, this is our first one covering um, TTB overview and permits. Uh, we will next be offering records, reports and returns followed by formulas, then labels. And then two new segments that um, we just created for this webinar series that we're really excited to offer, what to expect in an audit and what to expect in a product integrity investigation. And those are not at all meant to scare you and make you think that an auditor or investigator is going to come knocking at your door, but they're really aimed to give you good compliance tips. So if, if you ever get that knock at the door, um, you will be well positioned to just sail through uh, the investigation or audits. Um, and I have a spoiler that the next one is scheduled now for October 6th, and that will be records of reports and returns. So mark your calendar, um, Thursday, October 6th at 2 o'clock p.m. Eastern is when we'll be offering that. And the registration link for that will be available on our outreach program page uh, beginning tomorrow. So if you do uh, sign up for our TTB newsletter, which I hope you do, the registration link will be in there. Um, and also, I should say, please do sign up for our newsletter. It's a great resource for keeping up to date with TTB, everything that we're up to, if we have new guidance, if we see um, hot compliance issues or trends, um, really everything that you would want to know to keep up to date with us. Um, and that you can find um, if you Google uh, TTB newsletter, you'll be able to um, figure out how to sign up for that. Um, finally, after the presentation, there will be a survey slide. 
And I implore you to please, please fill that out. We find those to be so valuable. It will not only let uh, us know what you think about this presentation um, and how we did and whether it was valuable, um, but also how you like to get your educational content in the future and what topics you're interested in. So it really is um, important and valuable information uh, for us that we do um, account or that we take into account when um, creating our outreach plan for the year. Um, so with that, let me introduce our wonderful panel today. I have two lovely ladies. First, we have Jennifer Hill. Um, Jennifer is our new industry outreach program manager. And when I say new, I do mean new. She's been with the Bureau um, over a month now. So that, that's a landmark. Um, but she is not new to the Treasury Department. She comes to us from the Bureau of Fiscal Services, where she spent 16 years. Um, and now she, uh, she decided to come to our team, which we are absolutely um, thrilled with. And she's a face that you will probably recognize in the future if you attend industry conferences, because a large part of Jennifer's job will be coordinating our participation at conferences where we do presentations, we staff a TTB educational booth. So Jennifer will be at the booth, um, friendly face. So definitely if you find yourself at a conference with a TTB booth, um, pop by and say hi to her. Um, next, I oh, and also um, Jennifer will be moderating our questions for us at the end today. Uh, and then I would am delighted to introduce Amber Sippel. Amber is one of the technical advisors for the Application Services Division. And she has been with TTB since 2003, so pretty much since we were born. Um, and previously she was a specialist in the Application Services Division and she has been processing distilled spirits plant op, um, applications for the past 17 years, or seven years, sorry. <laughs> but she, she truly is an expert. Um, so again, I will start off our TTB uh, bootcamp today by providing a very brief overview of TTB um, and the laws that we implement. And then I'll turn it over to Amber um, to talk to you about permits, both original and amendments. And um, again, as we're going through the presentation, if you have questions, um, go ahead and submit those as we're going through. Um, but Jennifer will uh, read those with us at the end. All right, so. Let's have some fun and let's start off with some poll questions. All right, hopefully you can see the poll. This is my first time doing this, so I'm, I'm just going to assume that you can and cross my fingers. I'm seeing responses coming in, so you do, you are able to see the poll. So it looks like um, so far, most of our people are on the Eastern time zone. I thought this would be a fun way to get a sense of um, where you all are located. I'm assuming that most of you are distillers. So we have um, Eastern is our top pick, followed by Central, Pacific, and then Mountain. It looks like we need to get some more distilleries out there in the Colorado region. And nobody is somewhere fabulous outside of the continental US. I was hoping we might have some, some Hawaiians or Europeans joining us, Asians. <laughs> All right. And then the second question, how long have you been in business? <laughs> it looks like we have a lot of people that are, are really just in this to get two lunch breaks. <laughs> But we're really happy to see that, um, that there's some of you that are not yet in business um, and that you are excited to get started. So I don't know if you can see the, um, the answers, but I'm gonna end the poll and share the results. So maybe then you'll be able to um, see the answers. So there you are. So most of you are um, in the Eastern time zone and most of you have been in business for at least a year. So we are thrilled to have you. And then I have one more poll for you. And this one is really um, selfishly motivated. I would love to know, as the Director of Outreach, I would love to know what kind of information you would like to hear from us. Um, what topic are you most interested in? So I'll leave this up for about 30 seconds. All 
All right, we have 10 more seconds for the poll. And it is a multi-select. All right, well, I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll now and share the results. For those of you um, that are interested in, most interested in permits, the 20 of you that um, selected that, you are in luck today because that is what Amber will be covering. Um, but we are so happy to hear that you are interested in the other um, sessions. And um, as I had mentioned for the boot camp series, we will be covering records, reports, returns, formulas, labeling, the audits and investigations. The only one on here that we um, are not covering is trade practices. And um, we do have great uh, videos for those um, that I will tell you about later. Um, and if enough of you are interested in, we might be able to convince our trade practice division to, um, to offer a trade practice session as well. All right. Well, with that, let's go ahead, jump in and get started with the meat of the presentation. All right, so here we are. Hopefully all of you can see my screen and then you're still able to see um, all three of us. So again, this is the um, TTB webinar series, Bootcamp for Distillers. And we're calling this just the basics. The portion that I'm going to cover today is really the, the um, basic information that you'll, you'll need to know for interacting um, with TTB and complying with regulations. So um, any good government agency is going to have something like this um, as their opening slide. It is our disclaimer slide. It basically tells you that we're not here to establish any new guidance today or set forth any new policy. Um, if I happen to flub and say something incorrectly um, that is contrary to the laws or regulations, it is the laws and regulations that, that supersede whatever I'm going to tell you today. I'm just trying to um, communicate those laws and regulations to you. Um, in addition, if this is up on our website for a while and you would like to um, watch it again, um, there is a chance that any of the information that we're sharing could be superseded and become outdated. So always consult the most recent um, regulations. So what I'm going to cover is just a very um, general overview of TTB. We'll talk about the typical touch points um, that you'll have as distilleries for interacting with TTB. And then just very briefly, I'll, come, I'll go over the primary laws and regulations that you need to know. So our TTB overview. So we are a bureau, as I mentioned, within the Department of the Treasury. We are the newest office in the Department of the Treasury. We were formed in 2003, and that is when um, ATF splits and they went over to the Department of Justice. And we, the Alcohol and Tobacco Tax and Trade Bureau, TTB, were formed under the Treasury Department. Uh, we currently have about 480 employees. Um, our headquarters in Washington, D.C., and we are just right down the street from the main Treasury building and close to the White House. Uh, our Office of Permitting and Taxation is in Cincinnati, Ohio. And while I noted the uh, locations of our main offices, headquarters and uh, permitting and taxation, uh, we are still very largely remote working still. So some of us are remote working full time and some of us are going into the, off or into the office um, occasionally to full time. So we really are um, all over the board there. Uh, we have field offices located across the country in Puerto Rico, and our, our field offices are where our auditors and investigators are. And then we also have laboratories located in Maryland and California. So we really are um, located throughout the country. So our mission, um, being uh, under the Department of the Treasury, we are a tax collection agency, a revenue agency. So the first element in our mission is to collect the taxes. Um, we have a long and storied history of collecting taxes um, on behalf of the federal government, not we personally, um, <laughs> but the federal government of collecting taxes on alcohol beverages. In fact, the first ones were collected in 1791. Those were implemented by Alexander Hamilton to finance the Revolutionary War. Um, they were on for a little bit, they went back, they um, went off, and then we started um, collecting taxes again to pay for the Civil War. And then it's been, um, it's been um, consistent pretty much through then, except for during Prohibition. And speaking of Prohibition, um, after the end of Prohibition, when the 21st Amendment was enacted or ratified in 1930, or, um, 1933, the Federal Alcohol Administration Act passed, and that was um, implemented in 1935. 
And why I'm mentioning that, it really is important for the next three elements of our mission. The first one is really about the tax collection, but the next three um, are really because Congress wanted to um, prevent the societal harms that were coming um, from the consumption of alcohol in the way that it was regulated prior to prohibition. So with the um, Federal Alcohol Administration Act, which we call the FAA Act, and I'll tell you more about it later, the next three elements um, came from that. We protect the consumer, by ensuring the integrity of alcohol products. We ensure only qualified businesses enter the alcohol and tobacco industries. Um, so that's really keeping out um, the, the criminal um, aspect that came about after prohibition. And then um, we prevent the unfair and unlawful market activity for alcohol and tobacco products. And that's really um, keeping an eye on a level playing field. We want everybody to have a fair shot and they're not to be um, the, the incredibly dominant players that dominate the whole al um, alcohol landscape. So we try to protect um, and promote a level playing field. So our organizational chart, um, this is not a comprehensive organizational chart, but it is, um, it gives you the information that you need to know. Um, and I apologize for the formatting. I switched from um, PowerPoint to a Mac and it looks like it messed it up a little bit, but so forgive that. Um, but our administrator is Mary Ryan. Um, our deputy administrator is Dave Wolf. So they lead the agency. Our other offices are under that. So the ones that I wanna tell you about today are the um, Office of Permitting and Taxation, Headquarters Operations, and Field Operations. So within Permitting and Taxation, and again, um, that is the office that's in Cincinnati, Ohio. We used to call that the Revenue Center, the National Revenue Center, but now um, it is officially titled the Office of Permitting and Taxation. And under that, we have the Application Services Division and the Tax Services Division. Um, under Headquarters Operations, again, that's in Washington, DC. Uh, we have our Alcohol Labeling and Formulation Division, the Scientific Services Division, so that's our labs, and the Regulations and Rulings Division. That's the office that um, does our rulemaking and also publishes guidance um, and other um, informational materials. Our trade investigations is under our field operations, as well as our tax audit division. And then another office that I don't have listed here, but I am going to mention later, so I'll go ahead and mention it now too, is our market compliance office. So they are also part of our office of field operations. So um, with that, I'm going to just describe a little bit more the three offices that every distiller will interact with in the life cycle. So first we'll talk about um, the application services and tax services. So again, um, so application services, that's where Amber is coming from today. And that again is um, where uh, they issue the permit. So that's where you will submit your, um, your permit applications and your applications for amended permits. And um, they also do notices. And then um, the tax services division, they process your tax returns, operational reports and claims. And again, um, that is what we will be talking about next um, at our next boot camp, so on October sixth, is when we'll um, Rhonda Merrill, a technical advisor from the Tax Services Division, she'll be joining us for that. Um, and as I'd also mentioned, these um, slides will be available on our website, so you can. Um, we have a hot link here if you do need to contact the Office of Permitting Taxation um, hot link. It will take you right to our online um, web form where you can submit um, an inquiry to them. So the next big touch point and potentially your most frequent one will be the alcohol and label, alcohol labeling and formulation division. So they are the team that processes applications for beverage alcohol formulas and also for label approvals. And I'm going to touch on both of those things in greater depth in just a minute. Um, but again, uh, you can use this, these slides to um, use the hot link to submit an inquiry to them or feel to free to call their toll free number. All right, so with the, um, the typical touch point. So first you will qualify as a distilled spirits plant. So it looks like um, most of you have already qualified. Um, if you are new, that would be the very first step that you would take. And Amber is going to walk you through um, what you need to know about that. The next step is applying for formula approval if you need it. So, um, Oh, and I'll also note, backing up, that um, permits online would be the system that you would qualify as it is still spirits plant through. Um, for formula approval, you would use our formulas online system. 
And I will note that not all products need formulas. In fact, um, most of them probably don't. And if depending on what types of products you are producing, um, you may you may or may not apply for formula approvals. Um, currently, um, our formula approvals are only taking three days for distilled spirits, um, which is fantastic. So we recognize that when we have um, requirements that you need to follow and they do take time for us to process, um, it's important for us to process them as quickly as possible to allow you to get your products to market as soon as you can. We realize how important that is for you. And we spent a lot of, um, a lot of time and energy trying to revamp our processes, our systems to make it easier, make it faster. So we really do want you to succeed and get your products to market as soon as you can. Um, if you aren't sure if you need a formula for your product, we have a handy tool online that you can, um, it will walk you through, you enter in what type of product it is, and it will walk you through whether you need a formula. Um, over the last couple of years, we've revised those and made them even more user-friendly for both beer and wine. Um, we are currently in the process of doing that for distilled spirits. Um, we're actually going through user experience testing right now because we want it to be um, intuitive and easy for you to use. So um, that should be available next year for you. But again, um, we do have a tool available online that will give you the answer um, of whether you need a formula. So the next thing that you'll do, the, the fun thing, you produce your spirits. And um, just a reminder, as you're producing your spirits, you wanna keep records. If you aren't sure what records to keep or, um, or in what format or how frequent, um, definitely tune into our next webinar where Rhonda will, will talk you through um, all, all that you need to know about records. And then you are going to apply for label approval. So um, you'll do that with our COLAs online system. And you will either apply for a certificate of label approval or a certificate of label exemption, depending on whether you're producing and selling um, within the state that you're bottling. Um, otherwise you would, if you are going to bottle it and sell it in interstate commerce, you would need a certificate of label approval for that. Um, the requirements are mostly the same, but there is a little bit more flexibility with an exemption. Um, but again, um, everybody would need to apply for one of those. And I think most people would probably apply for a certificate of label approval. So then you will um, bottle and remove your products and keeping records. Then you will um, file your tax returns, pay your taxes and file operational reports. And again, we'll be covering that in our next module um, for records, reports and returns. And then this last one is reporting changes after qualification. We refer to those as amendments. And it doesn't necessarily go here in the flow of things because it could happen at any time. And Amber is going to walk you through um, what triggering events would require you to report a change. So you definitely want to pay attention to that. So um, getting into the laws um, and regulations. So there are really two primary laws um, that, that govern the regulations that we implement um, and how you do business every day. Uh, there, is, there are more, this isn't a complete list, but these are the two big ones. So we have the Internal Revenue Code and that is implemented in part 19 of the code of, um, so it's 27 CFR part 19, that's for distilled spirits plants. Um, and then the Federal Alcohol Administration Act that I had mentioned, um, that's at 27 CFR Part 5. So for those of you that aren't, um, <laughs> that aren't, that don't spend your life studying laws and regulations, the difference between the law and the regulation, the law is what Congress passes, and it's smaller. It's the it's um, sort of the framework. It's the bare bones of what needs to happen. And then the regulations are what implements that law. So it's going to be a lot longer, a lot more detailed. Um, so again, the Internal Revenue Code, um, you'll find those in 27 CFR Part 19 and um, for the FAA Act 27 CFR Part 5. So you definitely want to get familiar with both of those sets of regulations. So within the IRC requirements, it does apply to all alcohol beverages produced in the US. Um, some of the things that it includes, not all, again, think about the fact that this is our, um, this is our tax statute. And we, um, I think a good way for you to think of it is the um, collect the revenue part of our mission. It's the collect the revenue statute. So it includes um, requirements for your qualification, your record keeping requirements and reports, your taxes, 
um, formulas, um, again, only for some alcohol beverage products, and then minimum marks, brands, and label requirements. Um, the FAA Act also, that's where most of your label requirements will come from. They're just very minimal ones in the IRC. So while the IRC is the um, collect the revenue statute, um, you might wanna think of this as the protect the public statute. So this is where all of the requirements come in that make sure that consumers are aware of what they're purchasing um, so that what they see on the label matches what's in the container. Um, and so they're not misled. Um, so it applies. So the requirements are a little bit different. Um, the FAA Act, does apply to all domestic and imported alcohol beverage products, but only if they are sold or shipped in interstate commerce. So this is sort of the kicker with this one, um, is that it, the FAA Act is only triggered uh, for products that are shipped or sold in interstate commerce, so only when they're crossing state lines. And that includes uh, labeling requirements. There's a robust set of labeling requirements that you definitely want to be familiar with. Um, that's where the requirement for, um, to obtain a COLA comes from or an exemption. And then um, two that we aren't talking about in our boot camp series, um, but that you might wanna be aware of and um, get additional information on is our advertising and trade practice um, regulations. So um, both of those, um, our market compliance office um, oversees programs on both of those. So with advertising, I think a good rule of thumb is that if you can't put it on your label, it probably shouldn't be in your advertising. But if you aren't sure about what can go in your advertisements or not, the market compliance office does offer a pre-clearance service. So you can contact them, submit your, um, your advertising, and advertising does include social media. So be aware of that, that any requirements and prohibitions um, for other types of advertising, like traditional prints or media, um, also does um, apply to social media. So um, MCO, the Market Compliance Office, can um, they'll do a pre-clearance for you to make sure that you um, are in compliance and give you sort of peace of mind. And then um, with trade practices, um, we do have a set of five videos um, covering um, everything that you, um, all of the basics that you would want to know about trade practices. And for those of you that are, are just getting started out and you aren't sure what those are, it's, um, it's a set of activities that would be prohibited. Um, trade practices are really focused on keeping a level playing field um, and having everyone have equal market access. So definitely um, go to our website. Um, if you Google TTB trade practices, our trade practice um, website will pop up. You can watch those videos. You can read industry circulars. Um, industry circulars are another type of guidance um, that we put out. And then we also have an email box that you can submit inquiries to. So if you have a question on whether or not a certain activity is allowed, you can um, submit your email to the trade practice program manager and they will do an assessment and let you know of whether that's an allowable activity or not or a potential violation. And with that, um, some resources that you might find to be helpful um, as you are either getting started or you want to keep up to date with all of the latest information and educational contact. Um, so the first one that's on here is a direct link to us, um, to both Jennifer and myself. So that's um, a web form that you can use it to submit feedback, questions, if you need assistance with anything, if you have suggestions, please contest us and let us know. Um, also, our outreach program page is a great source of information for where we'll be, um, where we'll be providing um, information, where you can find us at. It will have all of our webinar um, schedules and registration links on there. Conferences will be at um, booths and other presentations. So um, definitely um, bookmark that page. And then finally, um, our TTB Learning Center. So that's where we've tried to compile a lot of resources for both new and established industry members. So through that link of the TTB Learning Center, you can find videos, tutorials. Um, so in addition to our trade practice videos, which are also linked through there, we have a great series of proofing videos. So if you um, are new to proofing, or if you're finding that you're having um, difficulties proofing or having compliance issues with it, definitely go check out our proofing videos. Um, and then we have a number of other tutorials and informational um, materials on there. And then finally, as I had mentioned at the beginning, um, recent presentations are available on our presentations page. And again, that is where these slides will be located after the presentation. 
So with that, that kind of wraps up the summary and the overview. And I will go ahead and turn it over to Amber um, to talk about the permits, original and application and amendments. Thanks, Chanel. As mentioned today, we're going to go going to go briefly over original applications for a distilled spirits plant referred to as a DSP and subsequent amendments. And Amber, I am so sorry. I'm trying to figure out how to let you take control of the screen, um, but I can't see my I can't see my cursor, so I'm like flying blind here. So if you want, I can just um, flip and just give me a cue. I can do that. So you can go to the next slide mm -hmm. and then we'll go to the next one. So we have two definitions that I'd like to review with you first. Let's go over general premises. So general premises is any business office, service facility, or other part of the premises described in the notice of registration other than bonded premises. For example, these would be things such as your storage of tax paid spirits, your offices, lunch rooms, restrooms, and non-alcoholic storage. I'd like to point out that general premises are not required. However, it's good to have in case you store any tax paid goods. Next slide, please. Oh, good, thank you. The next definition we'll cover is bonded premises. And bonded premises is just the premises of a distilled spirits plant or part thereof as described in the application for registration on which the conduct of distilled spirits operations is authorized. This term applies regardless of whether or not the proprietor is required to hold a bond. So potentially, you can have two defined areas within your application. You have your general premises, then you have your bonded premises. And TTB really prefers when you submit your application that these be clearly identified as well within the application as well as on the diagram. Next, please. When you begin working on gathering your information, you'll need to determine if a bond is necessary. So what is a bond and how do you know if you even need one? Well, a bond is similar to an insurance policy. And as you can see here, if you fail to pay any tax liability covered by a bond, TTB may seek payment from you, from the surety who issues your bond or from both. Your individual circumstances will really dictate whether or not you need a bond. So there are some things that you're gonna to wanna to think about. You're gonna to wanna to think about what is your anticipated excise tax liability? Which type of BSP operations are you gonna conduct? And remember, there are three. You have distiller, warehouseman, and processor. And most importantly, will your operations involve industrial, beverage, or both types of alcohol? Next, please. The PATH Act of 2017 amended the IRC, which remembers the Internal Revenue Code, regarding bonds. So taxpayers who reasonably expect to be liable for not more than $50,000 in taxes for the calendar year and were, not, and were liable for not more than $50,000 in such taxes in the preceding calendar year are exempt from the requirements to file bonds covering operations or withdrawals. It's important to note that the PATH Act did not remove the bond requirements for industrial alcohol. So if you plan to produce industrial alcohol, you are going to be required to obtain a bond. Please. So now that we've talked a little bit about bonds, let's talk about the terms bond and bonded. These are used to modify certain terms throughout 27 CFR part 19 which again are the TTB regulations that govern DSPs. When used, they apply to distilleries with a bond or that are exempt under the PATH Act from having a bond. You'll often hear us talk about your bonded premises. This is the location of your production and storage of untaxed paid spirits. You're also going to hear us talk about transfers and bonds. A transfer and bond is when a domestic DSP transfers spirits that the tax had not been paid on to another domestic DSP. Next, please. And while we're on that topic of transfer and bonds, if you're gonna receive bulk spirits in bond from another domestic distilled spirits plant, 
You should complete either an amendment in Permits Online, if you were a Permits Online filer, or a paper amendment, which is, which is done through TTB Form 5100.16. You are required to fill out this form whether or not you obtain a bond. Remember to use the $13.50 per proof gallon when you calculate the potential liability on any transferred spirit. And then once approved, a transfer and bond form will be attached to your application and you should provide a copy to the supplier transferring those spirits to you. And there's a couple of things that I wanna tell you about as far as transfer and bonds are concerned. Number one, and this is a big one, a new transfer and bond is required for each company that you plan to receive spirits from. So for example, company A, company B, and company C all require separate transfer and bond approvals. Now down the road, if any information on that form changes, you're gonna to need to file a new amendment for a new approved transfer and bond form. For example, if you have a change in location, the change in location is going to affect the information found on your transfer and bond form and therefore requires a new transfer and bond approval from TTB. Another example for obtaining a new transfer and bond would be if you're required to carry a bond and information on that bond form changes. So if you increase your amount of bond coverage, decrease your amount of bond coverage, if you uh, change any information on that bond, you're gonna wanna redo your transfer and bond. So you really just want to ensure that if any information on that form changes, you submit an amendment for a new and updated transfer and bond approval. That was all one, I got two more for you. <laughs> So the form must also be approved prior to receiving the transfer of spirits. And number three, under the Temporary Craft Beverage Modernization Act, which you'll hear us refer to as CBMA, bottled spirits in bond can no longer be transferred in bond unless it is to another location under the same ownership. Next, please. Now that we've covered, cover, excuse me, covered a couple definitions and some information on bonds, let's talk about your location. For a DSP per 27 CFR 19.52, there are some restrictions on the location of your DSP premises. So let's keep in mind that prior to even submitting your application to our office, you should have a secure location. So you're probably wondering what these kinds of restrictions are. Well, you can see them listed here, but let's run through them. So a DSP cannot be located in any of the following places, in any residence, shed, yard, or enclosure connected to a residence, on any vessel or boat, where beer or wine is produced, where liquors are sold at retail, or where any other business is conducted, except is provided in 19.54. I'd like to state here that in practice, some of these restrictions can be highly technical and fact dependent. Next slide, please. Did you know that before your application is approved, construction of your premises should be complete with any necessary equipment in place or on order? You cannot begin producing any kind of spirit until you receive your approved DSP registration and your permit. Next slide, please. Can we go back just one? Okay, that's fine. I might have been a little bit out of order. We can go to the next one. There we go, thank you. Another thing to have in order prior to filing an application is knowing exactly who the applicant is. Are you going to apply as a sole proprietor, a partnership, a corporation, an LLC, or maybe even some other type of entity? You'll wanna have that figured out prior to starting your online application. Next, please. 
So now that we know what kind of business structure you want to have, you need to know what you need to gather. And there are a lot of number of supporting documents that you'll be required to submit within your application. So you wanna make sure that you plan ahead and gather these documents before you begin. Next, please. So some of these documents include your organizational documents, which establish your business entity. So for example, your operating agreement, your bylaws, and confirmation of your business name via the Secretary of State. That's all gonna depend on the type of business structure that you've chosen. You're gonna to wanna to have a lease or proof of property ownership. And you'll wanna also include signing authority authorization, which as you can see here, can be established in multiple ways. The last thing you'll wanna send is a diagram of the DSP premises. And here you're gonna to wanna to identify your bonded premises, your general premises, your tasting room and or retail sales area and state what kind of physical separation is in place if need be. Next, please. We seem to have a frozen screen. Let me give it a second. Sure. Are we on the correct slide? Oh, I'm sorry. Back one more. We're on register for an account. There we go. Thank you. So now that we have all of our ducks in a row, we're ready to start the online process. We encourage you to use our permits online portal, which you'll often hear us refer to as PONL. And as you see here, this is a screenshot of the home screen within the PONL system, and you're going to want to click that register for an account. Next slide, please. Once you create an account and you begin the application process, you'll notice that your information in Permits Online is organized into two different kinds of records. So first you have your entity record, which equates to a single company or business entity represented by a unique employer identification number. And second, you have a commodity operations record, which is created for each TTB regulated operation the entity is approved to conduct. A typical entity record will have at least one, but it may have multiple commodity operation records associated with it. And we'll kind of take a look at that here in just a minute. Next slide, please. When applying to start your first TTD regulated business, you will complete one new entity application and a new commodity operations application for each operation you intend to conduct. When you file an amendment related to the business entity, you will file one application and the changes are then associated with each operation that you conduct. So can we go to the next slide? For example, on the next slide, you're gonna see here that you have your business entity record, which houses all of your corporate information. And then underneath of that, you'll see there are three commodity records for this particular company. And in that entity record is where you will need to add POAs, signing authorities, or update any officer listings, all within that one entity record. And then it will cover all three of the, sorry, within the entity record, and it will cover all three commodity operations. Next slide, please. Within the Ponald Wizard, applicants are asked a series of questions, and this is to help distinguish what can and cannot be done at a distillery. So it's similar to any kind of TurboTax system that you may have used in the past, and the system also allows you, once you submit your application or amendment, 
you have the ability to track your application through all of the processing stages. Next slide, please. Once you have obtained your approval for your original application, down the road or maybe even while you're applying, you may need to file some type of amendment. Amendments are put into two categories. So again, you're gonna have your entity amendments and you're gonna have your commodity amendments. So entity amendments are what you see here and those are changes made in that corporate structure. So if you remember the top of the pyramid that we just looked at before. These are gonna include such things as changes in your legal business name, any kind of controlling ownership changes, any officer changes, adding or removing any kind of signing authority. And you'll notice you also have the ability here to do a termination. I'm gonna caution you because if you have many businesses under the one entity, if you terminate at the entity level, you're going completely out of business. So that means you're terminating everything. So you do have that functionality within the Permits Online system to do that. I also want to mention before going to the next slide that controlling ownership is extremely important. And if you have any changes in controlling ownership, you want to make sure that you're notifying TTD immediately. We can go to the next slide, please. So as mentioned, uh, the second category are your commodity operation amendments. So these are going to include things like changes to your premises location, changes to your bond, or if you have to add a bond down the road, any construction changes, or if you add a building next door, things like that. You also have the ability to add or remove trade names, non-contiguous premises, alternations, and any variances. You'll see here as well, you have the ability to terminate. At this level, when you terminate in the commodity record, you're only terminating that one location. So if you have multiple locations, you only wanna terminate one, you're gonna do that at your entity level record. So everything else under that EIN would remain open. We can go to the next slide, please. So two of the more cumbersome amendments that TTD reviews are alternating premises and alternating proprietors. And we're gonna go over both, but first we're gonna to touch on alternating premises. So alternating premises is when the premises is used by the same proprietor, same owner, same EIN, and you're gonna conduct another TTD regulated business such as a winery or a brewery. If you're already an established DSP and you wish to add a winery or a brewery, you're going to need to submit a new application for the commodity operations that you're adding, updated diagrams showing which areas will be alternated and which areas will remain dedicated premises for each commodity. And if you were required to file a bond, you'll have to do a consent of surety. Depending on the type of alternation that you're going to do, there may be some variances, as you see there, that you're gonna to need to submit. One thing I should have mentioned about that diagram, when you, when you send that diagram in, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you show the separation and what kind of material you're using to separate those commodities, so to dedicate their space. Next slide, please. Now, alternating um, proprietorships is when you have two or more proprietors with different EINs who wanna conduct the same operations at the same premises. So you own a DSP, your buddy owns a DSP, and you guys decide that you want to operate in the same space and you wanna share some equipment and you're gonna alternate back and forth with who's, who's running the operations there. So generally the proprietor of an existing DSP will refer to as the host distiller agrees to rent space and equipment to a tenant distiller. So the host and tenant of an alternating proprietorship has to submit an alternating proprietorship agreement, which is essentially just a contract between the two of you, an updated diagram, again, showing areas that will be alternated and non-alternated areas of both the head of the host and the tenant. And then you'll need to also submit the variance request. While that variance request isn't required, we really strongly encourage you to use that variant because otherwise you're gonna to have to file a letterhead notice prior to each alternation that you do. Next slide, please. 
As Janelle has mentioned, CTB's website offers a wide range of resources for you. We recommend you visit our site to gain an understanding of your industry, as well as your responsibilities while you hold a regulated permit or registration with our office. So this is a, just a list of some great resources that we have available to you on our website. Next, please. And lastly, we know that at some point, you're gonna to need to reach out to us. You're gonna have questions. So below is our contact information, and you can see there our phone number, our um, contact form, which is where you can click the button. You can send us your written request, and then someone usually responds quickly. And then we have representatives available from 8 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. on uh, Eastern Time, Monday through Friday. So at this time, I'm going to hand it back over to Janelle, who's going to facilitate our question and answers. Thank you so much, Amber. That was jam-packed with information. So I imagine there's um, there's <laughs> attendees out there that have questions on it. So definitely submit those questions. Um, in the meantime, I I hope you will take a screenshot or get your cameras out, um, get that QR code. Otherwise, you can just do um, ttb.gov backslash survey. And that is where you will find our survey. And again, that would be, it should only take five minutes to fill out um, and it would be highly valuable. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and we will jump into the questions and answers. So we did have one question that I went ahead and answered in the Q&A box. So hopefully you all are able to see that. Somebody had asked how to contact our market compliance office. So I did put the phone number and the email address as well as the website where you can see our market compliance office on ttb.gov in the answer box. And then there were a few questions that I thought maybe would be good to answer live to the crowd. So, and they kind of go hand in hand, a few of them. So the first one is, what is the difference between DSP registration and DSP permit? And Amber, I'm hoping you'll be able to answer that question for the, for the group. <laughs> That's fine. My phone went off. I was trying to unmute it. Um, okay, so DSP registration is under the Internal Revenue Code. And so you, when you're filling out your DSP registration, that's where the bulk of your um, premises description goes. Um, any non-contiguous premises that you may be adding is all found within the DSP registration. And then your DSP permit is, it falls under the FAA. So that's usually just a one pager. Uh, when you get it, um, it shows your company name, it shows you your permit and your registry number. Um, and that's really the difference between those two is, is the, the DSP registration is under the Internal Revenue Code and the permit is found under the FAA Act. Thank and you. Amber, for the attendees, are both of those um, questions answered in PONL in the Permits Online system? Yes. So when you go through Permits Online, you're not going to really see a big difference um, as far as, you know, this is for the registration and this is for the permit you're going to just complete the online portal. And then when we approve the application, the DSP registration and permit automatically generate and get attached to that application. Thank you. So the next uh -huh. question we have is, what if you are a DSP and want to add a warehouse location for maturation of spirits that is not attached to the original DSP? Is that a separate application or an amendment? Good question. So that's really going to depend. Um, you can do a non-contiguous location as long as you're within 10 miles of your original DSP. If you're outside of the 10 mile mark, uh, you're going to have to qualify for a new application. But then that also gets into, there's a regulation out there about only being allowed to warehouse if you're storing 250,000 gallons or more. So it's something that you would really want to work with your specialist on to determine possibly your best route there. Thank you. Um, okay, so then these are kind of related. So currently own, if somebody currently owns a DSP for alcohol, and they're considering starting to make mead, what should they consider? Sure. So this can be quite loaded as well. So you're, you're going to need to do a winery application. You're going to need to determine whether or not you're alternating. So if you're sharing equipment or not, 
um, if you're not sharing equipment and you're not sharing space, they're going to be completely separate and you're not going to have any type of retail sales, um, you, you'll you just submit possibly the winery application. If you are going to alternate, um, there are some things, there are some requirements that you need to have in place in order to have your dedicated area. So for example, you would need to carve out an area that's going to be solely dedicated to where you're going to produce your mead, and then you're going to have to carve out an area that's going to be solely dedicated to your distilled spirits production. And those both need to be segregated by, at a minimum, some type of four foot high wall. Now, when I say wall, it doesn't have to be a stud and drywall, but uh, you have to propose to TTB what you think that sufficient segregation would be for the wall. Um, and we'll come back and let you know whether or not that that is approvable. And then the next, que next question is, so the alternating premise is an exception to the rule against getting a DSP in the same location where beer or wine is produced. So again, this is gonna, it can be highly technical and very fact dependent upon how you're doing it and how you're laying it out. Um, you, you need to have total um, dedicated space for each commodity. If you have a tasting room or retail sales, that may throw a wrench into it. So that's something that you may wanna reach out to our office with your specific scenario um, and see if you can't get some direct guidance on. Thank you, Amber. And then we have one final question. Does TTB regulate sugar-based ALC seltzer or is that FDA? And I can take that one. Um, so it depends, I guess, on what you're producing, but assuming when you say a sugar-based alcohol seltzer, um, that would be a beer base. Um, so under the inter internal revenue code, beer is defined as an alcohol beverage with 0.5% greater alcohol content by volume made with malted barley or a substitute for malt um, and sugar is a substitute for malt. So if you are producing um, a sugar a, a fermented sugar based alcohol um, alcoholic seltzer, um, it would be regulated as a beer under the internal revenue code. Um, where it would be a little bit different is, is that it is not considered um, a malt beverage for the purposes of labeling under the FAA Act. So um, in that regard, the labeling of that, assuming that it was produced just from fermented sugar and it didn't contain both malted, malted barley and hops, um, it would fall within FDA's labeling jurisdiction. So again, it would be all of the internal revenue requirements for um, TTB but just the labeling um, would fall under FDA. And I would note too, that because the um, formula requirements are under the Internal Revenue Code, um, it is very likely that if you're flavoring your product, you would still need to submit um, a TTV formula approval. So um, all of your records, reports, returns, formulas, TTV, um, just the, the labeling would be within, um, within FDA jurisdiction. Thank you, Janelle. And those are all of our questions. So I just wanna take this time to tell Amber and Janelle, thank you so much. You both did a wonderful job. And I also wanna thank all of our attendees too for calling in today. This was a great first webinar. Oh, looks like maybe we had one question come in. Okay. You mentioned that cased goods cannot be transferred in bond except to or from a DSP owned by the same entity. What about when bulk ready to bottle spirits are sent to a bottler? Can the bottler then send the spirits back to the DSP for removal from bond? I would probably have to look into the CBMA and get back to you on that, Jennifer. Um, is there a way to get contact information for her? Yes, um, yes, Jennifer, if you can send a chat message in here, I think you can send one even just private um, with your email address and phone number, we would love to get back to you. And then we had one more question come in. Can you explain more about the four foot wall to separate spaces? Sure. So uh, essentially, and hopefully this will help, um, 
any, any TTB operation that you conduct, any TTB commodity operation. So you could do a DSP, you could do a winery, and you could do a brewery all at the same location. Again, depending on whether or not you have a tasting room or retail sales is going to put in some, some possibly different requirements. However, let's go, there's no retail sales um, and no tasting room, and it's just strictly the three commodity operations that you're doing. In that instance, you would need to have three areas. They can be as large as you want or as small as you want because there's no regulation that specifies how large or how small that area is. Um, but those areas would each need to be surrounded by some type of barrier. Uh, things that are not allowed are things like um, tape on the floor to say that this is, this is where my dedicated space is going to be. Um, curbing material, that wouldn't be allowed either. We're trying to ensure that we're protecting the revenue and the, and the public um, in case anything were to spill, it doesn't go on to another premises. So uh, hopefully that helps. Uh, but I would also suggest if you have more questions about that to reach out to us as well. Thank you, Amber. We are so lucky that we have your wealth of knowledge here with us today to share with everyone. Thank and you. as as Jennifer had just mentioned, we are so happy that you joined us. Thank you all so much. We hope you tune in to the next one, um, October 6th at 2 p.m. Eastern. And for um, we're planning for um, them about every two weeks after that. So um, keep a lookout for the schedule and we hope to see you again soon. Have a great day. Bye. Visit TTB's official YouTube channel at USTTB.gov for more TTB-related content. And remember to click subscribe so you'll always know when we upload new videos.